but I have the great honor of introducing our next speaker. David is having a bit of a moment right now. You might have noticed if you were at his talk yesterday, he's on fire, uh, both here in Vermont and around the country uh, with his most recent book on Frederick Douglass. It's arrived to near universal acclaim, and one might hope that a copy of his biography might just find its way into the Oval Office. <laughs> David Blight is class of 1954, a professor of American history at Yale University. He's also the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. He is one of the nation's foremost authorities on the US Civil War and its legacy, and he is the author of A Slave No More, Two Men Who Escaped to Freedom, Including Their Narratives of Emancipation, and Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory, which received eight book awards, including the Bancroft Prize, the Abraham Lincoln Prize, and the Frederick Douglass Prize, among other awards. His book, American Oracle, The Civil War in the Civil Rights Era, received the 2012 Ainsfield Wolf Award for Best Book in Nonfiction on Racism and Human Diversity, and he is currently touring and is with us here today with his acclaimed biography, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Blight. You never know when you'll need a big book with you. It's just it's for security. It's, uh, it's not the Bible. It's a collection of Douglas's speeches, just in case. Um, thank you. And first of all, congratulations to Morgan. Um, I spent the first seven years of my career as a high school teacher. I never taught eighth grade. I always thought people who teach eighth grade are, are God's children, I, you know. Um, um, and I want to say, too, that, you know, it's such a cliche to say that teachers are the most important people in our society. So I just said it. It's a cliche. Uh, but I still believe the high, the high school teaching I did in the 1970s in my hometown of Flint, Michigan, um, is the most important teaching I ever did. I mean, a lot of the kids I teach now don't need me very much. <laughs> um, and I, I was just reminded, too, uh, one of the first Wednesday talks I gave was, I think, in Manchester. And it was uh, two years ago, maybe? Uh, Peter Gilbert will remember. And it was, it was a wonderful evening. It was in a church. The place was packed. And there was an entire class of high school kids who came. And afterward, we took a group photo of the high school students, and I was somewhere in the middle of them there. And I still have that photo on my, on my phone. Once in a while, when I'm streaming through photos, I see that picture, and I think, gosh, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> the theme of this conference is, is difficult, isn't it? Optimism, it's ebb and flow. Or hope, it's ebb and flow. Progress, it's ebb and flow in American culture or history. Um, <laughs> I've been hanging around with a few people here yesterday and today, and we tend to joke about it, you know. Are any of the speakers going to get a one or a two on a grade, you know, of 10 about optimism at this conference? Have any of us reached a two yet? Or a three? Or, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to give you a mixed story, if you like. Um, I'm going to first try to turn on, oh, this has a light, fantastic. There's so many podiums that don't have lights, and they forget that that's useful. Um, this is a talk I have been working on. I have only given it once before. This is a different, new vari variation. Um, I gave it first to a conference of teachers. Actually, they were liberal arts college teachers last spring in Atlanta. And their big theme was progress, American diversity, college campuses. Can America ever get unified again? Big problem on college campuses, big problem everywhere. So 
What I do in this talk is I reach out to two or three of my heroes for help. And don't we all do that? How many of you keep so-and-so next to your bed just once in a while because you need to read Emerson? Or Walt Whitman? Whitman's leaves of grass is always nearby for me. Uh, he, when I go, if the two years I went abroad, uh, you know, you have to teach, you have to decide, okay, what books am I taking? And I've always taken Leaves of Grass, you know, sometimes if you need a boost, it's there in Whitman. Um, although I'm not going to use Whitman in this talk. <laughs> there are also a couple people in this talk that are not my heroes. Frederick Douglass, and the, most of this talk is not about Douglass, I promised that yesterday. Yesterday's talk was about Douglass. I'm going to give you a little bit of a break from Douglass, but not entirely. In a speech he gave in eight, between 1867 and 69, now keep that timing in mind, it was called the Composite Nation, which I think is the title we put on this talk. This is a very hopeful moment. It's, it's the peak of Reconstruction. The war's just been over for a year or two. The radical Republicans have wrested control of Reconstruction policy, or so it seems, from Andrew Johnson, who wants to keep America in a state of uh, pre-1861. And Douglas just flowed forth in this speech with a level of hope he almost never entirely would match again. He called it composite nation. In it, there are many passages worth quoting. I'll just quote one to start. He said, quote, A man is a man the world over. This fact is affirmed and admitted in any effort to deny it. The sentiments we exhibit, whether love or hate, confidence or fear, respect or contempt, will always imply a like humanity. Even when we express hatred of somebody, Douglas was saying, we're really recognizing their humanity. We resent them. They probably have done something we might wish we could have. We might have something we envy. We don't even know it, maybe. In those late 1860s, this heyday of Reconstruction, when the United States was trying, the not so United States was trying to reinvent itself. And it did in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution and the first, uh, the first Civil Rights Act passed in 1866 and the Reconstruction Acts. For a moment in time of three, four, five, six years, it looked like the United States was indeed having its second revolution. It was reinventing itself out of the horrific bloodshed and all that terrible sacrifice of the Civil War. In the wake of the ratification especially of the 14th Amendment with Section 1 about birthright citizenship, due process, and equality before law, the Constitution under which we really live, and it, which has been under some duress of late from either those too venal to understand it or too ignorant to understand it. It was in this moment that Douglas fashioned this idea of a composite nation. Like some other former abolitionist, and he's not alone with this, Douglas believed the United States had just experienced a new founding in the Civil War and out of the emancipation of four million slaves. And they were in the midst of recrafting this Constitution, making it new. He also became, for a while, a kind of overnight proponent of American expansion. This was the radical Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, who, like most abolitionists, had spent most of his career to this point not only criticizing the United States, but at times actually hating it. Now, in the wake of this war, in the wake of emancipation, possibilities made him think, well, maybe the United States should now export these ideas 
to the rest of the world, especially in his view to the Caribbean. He thought the United States could not be driven by an ideology of abolitionism, a universal manhood suffrage, and equality before law. And he believed Americans could now possibly invent a new nation whose values were worth sending out to other societies that were still riven in pro-slavery doctrine or pre-modern systems of inequality like Santo Domingo, like Haiti, uh, like other parts of the Caribbean, and he will actually serve on President Grant's Santo Domingo Commission in 1871, which went there for the purpose of trying to annex part of Santo Domingo. Might a newly forged United States built from the ashes of a horrific war slough off its former structures, its earlier national identity, its former constitutionalism, and its contested story as a pro-slavery nation and become the dream of the authors of emancipation and union victory. Remember moments in history of great possibility? It's worth trying, especially now. Could history itself have made such a fundamental shift toward a multi-ethnic, multi-racial nation born of the massive blood sacrifice of Gettysburg and Antietam and the contraband camps full of refugees? Could the tremendous resistance of the white South and the former Confederates be somehow blunted and incorporated into a new vision of what Douglas was calling here a composite nationality? I'm quoting him here, separating church and state, giving allegiance to a single constitution federalizing the Bill of Rights and spreading liberty more broadly than any civilization had ever attempted. Man, you can get elected on that, maybe. Could a diverse nation truly live under equality before law? This, this was new. We do not often think of the Reconstruction era as a time of almost utopian thinking. But knowing what was soon to transpire in American history, such a vision does seem in retrospect a little utopian. And in our dystopian moment, a lot of things do. Douglass's immediate post-war, post-Civil War definition of a nation came very close to Benedict Anderson's famous modern conception of a nation's, academics are always quoting Benedict Anderson, I'm sorry, but he famously defined a nation. He's an anthropologist, we all quote him. He defined a nation as, quote, an imagined community. It's not a complicated concept. We imagine ourselves a community. Here you are. Douglas said a nation, these were Douglas's words, implied a willing surrender and subjection of individual aims and ends, often narrow and selfish, to the broader and better ones that arise out of a society as a whole. It is both a sign and a result of civilization. Suppress the selfish, enhance the whole. That's that's what we want an eighth grade class to believe in. And we want them to believe it when they're in the 12th grade. And we want them to believe it when they're 50 years old. Don't we? As a nation in the 19th century, as well as now, one might believe any nation demands a story that holds it together, that draws its constituent parts to somehow adhere to a whole. But how do you do that? E, pluribus unum, is a wonderful aspiration. Do you wake up every day saying, E, pluribus union, E, pluribus union? No, you wake up, you turn on NPR, you read the paper, and you think, oh, God, what outrage happened now? <laughs> One might wonder how the former slave, this Frederick Douglass, who had delivered some of the most embittered attacks on American racism and hypocrisy, 
before and during the Civil War could now in the late 1860s, at least in that moment, believe his newly saved and reinvented country was, his words, the most fortunate of nations and at the beginning of our ascent. Well, that's what every person running for high office says, right? I believe America's best days are all ahead of us. You have to say that if you're running for office. I think at this moment he actually believed it. In the first quarter century of his public life, though, back in the 1840s into the 1850s and up to the Civil War, few Americans left a more thoroughgoing chastisement of the tyranny and tragedy at the heart of America's institutions, of its actions, and its history. Now step back with me to an earlier moment in his life. When Douglas returned from his extraordinary 19-month first visit to Great Britain, I was in 1845 to 1847, just after he published his narrative, where he had been celebrated all over Ireland, Scotland, and, and Britain, and he'd been treated with a, a degree of equality that he had never experienced in America. He let it be known, his words, that home or country were now very ambivalent concepts for him. There was a part of him that didn't want to come back. He was excited to be back among his abolitionist comrades, but America was another matter. I have no love for America as such, he announced when he got back in 1847. I have no patriotism. I have no country. That's pretty direct and harsh. Douglas let his righteous anger flow in metaphors of degradation, chains, and blood. The institutions of this country, he said, his words, do not know me, do not recognize me as a man, except as a piece of property. The only thing attaching him to his native land at that point, he said, was his family and his deeply felt ties to the, quote, three millions of my fellow creatures groaning beneath the iron rod with stripes upon their backs. Only their clanking chains, he said, and their warm blood making fat the soil of Maryland and Alabama had drawn him back. Such a country, said Douglas, he could not love. I desire, he said, to see it overthrown as speedily as possible and its constitution shivered into a thousand fragments. Uh, that's what the Civil War actually will do. He didn't know it yet. Douglas was already a master at that point of the rhetorical device we know as the Jeremiah calling the fallen nation or people back to its lost principles, the old Puritan style of sermonic rhetoric. But he was also now portraying himself as the victim of pro-slavery scorn. And he enjoyed being the aggressor. He was constantly under attack for, he, he said, irritating people rather than feeding their need for a pleasing story. And to that, Douglas said, he, quote, pled guilty. I admit that we have irritated them. They deserve to be irritated. As it is in physics, so in morals, there are cases that demand irritation and counter-irritation. The conscience of the American public needs irritation and I will blister it all over from center to circumference until it gives signs of a purer life than it is now manifesting. That's the aggressive, radical, outsider abolitionist always attacking from outside. He's going to live to become an insider and write that composite nation speech. But he named the demons, and he stalked his prey as the latter-day Jeremiah, he spoke like the ancient prophet, calling the nation to judgment for its mendacity, its wanton violation of its own covenants, warning 
of its imminent ruin and demanding that it create a new story. Douglas had always believed in America's mission, that the United States was fundamentally some kind of set of ideas, despite, as he said, even in the hopeful mode of 1869, its, quote, tangled network of contradictions. And are we not a tangled network of contradictions? His temporary optimism of this moment, that is the 1869 Reconstruction Douglas now, says much about the explosions of hope and the transformative character of emancipation, the end of slavery. Douglas admitted that he had never believed in any kind of perfectionism, but he did think the new nation of early Reconstruction could now provide humankind a new aspiration. Quote, the perfect national illustration. This is what he saw the United States possibly becoming. The perfect national illustration of the unity and dignity of the human family. God, such misty-eyed hope. Don't we yearn for that? or people who can put it into those words. On good days, many Americans still want to believe in a narrative of American history bound up in this perception of the possibilities of multi-ethnic cultural harmony. Others still demand a cohesive narrative of progress and greatness, the story of a special problem-solving nation providing beacons of light and cities on a hill for all the world to model. Don't we want to believe in that? As a culture, we have never lacked for writers or politicians or poets and artists who savor and recreate that triumphal conception of American history. It doesn't die. I want to dwell a moment on the 19th century's most famous proponent of a kind of perfect, triumphal America. There was no one who spun the yarns of America's progress in the 19th century under a Christian God's guidance more than George Bancroft. And if you don't read George Bancroft anymore, that's okay. He was a gentleman scholar, although it would do you well to just dip a toe or two back in him to see where this all came from. He was a gentleman scholar who wrote many books and gave zillions of speeches, fashioning a narrative of American greatness as a model for human unity, and he wrote in the antebellum era up to the Civil War. He was educated at Harvard and in Germany. He wrote, ten, he wrote a 10-volume history of the United States. It was entitled, The History of the United States from the Discovery of the Continent. And he wrote it between 1834 and 1874. And he spent decades writing this. And he had zillions of readers. His vision of the history of America was one rooted in unquestioned faith in progress, in providence, in the necessity of patriotism, and in democratic and republican values. His history virtually sang a kind of Hail Americana. To this day, those who insist upon or uncritically wish for a unifying narrative of America's history and future, knowingly or not, are hearkening back to Bancroft and his many imitators. The question before American historians and their readers has been, has always been for a century and more whether we, and there's that word, we can imagine a unified national story of our multiplicity, our violence, our embrace of and hostility to immigrants, our racism, our profound tragedies, and yes, our considerable triumphs of human will and sacrifice. Such a unified story was all but obliterated, it seemed, 
in the Civil War. But the idea of America does not die. It has been too long in its evolution out of the Enlightenment world, and for that matter, out of the classical world, and for that matter, out of the epistles of Paul and many other places. It serves the aspirations for liberty and freedom in too many hamlets and cultures we don't even know. But whether a United States can remain unified, changing and growing with a rich and abiding national story of renewed potency is a very open question right now. And there was Bancroft the, with muscular confidence, a breathtaking belief somehow, even as it seems so blind and out of place in our world today. In an oration on the 50th anniversary of the New York Historical Society, where he parked himself most of the time to write his books, he was a gentleman scholar, he had private wealth, he didn't have to have a day job. But in 1854, this is the piece of Bancroft, if you ever read any Bancroft, don't, don't worry about those 10 volumes. But he wrote a speech, it was an essay speech, it was just entitled Progress. And he gave to historical thinking in a romantic age its set of creeds. He believed that, quote, each successive generation is wiser than its predecessor. Do we believe that? We want to. Where are the, not a lot of really young people here today. We don't have to offend anybody. As an article of faith rooted in ideas about nature, he asserted, this is Bancroft, the movement of the human mind taken collectively is always toward something better. And, you know, and that makes you think of Obama always using Martin Luther King's, who was using Theodore uh, Parker's famous line, the arc of history always bends toward justice. Does it? Check out the word always, and we might be able to work with it. Every time Obama used that line, I kept thinking, oh, come on. Of course, he had to say it. He was president. And by the way, he has a copy of my book signed. Uh, the current president doesn't. <laughs> now, uh, and I have to confess, I, I got the request from a, the woman who is the head of his museum and library, whom I happen to know because she used to work at Yale. She saw the book, she said, would you inscribe a copy for President Obama? I'll be seeing him next week. And I said, will I? I said, will she? Ah, yes. But I worked on it. I wrote it out two or three times first before I put it in the book, you know. I don't know if he's read it. Now, as an article of faith rooted in ideas, um, we want to believe that, don't we? Now, whether a person's temperament is conservative, absolutist or reformist or however you see yourself. Bancroft insisted, without testing his assumptions against any history, that a divine providence provided unity, his words, in the universe as well as the anchor of our hope. Uh, sometimes you do, I, I don't want to live in the 19th century. They had bad hygiene. Train travel was really tough. Um, but sometimes you do want to kind of float back into the 19th century and just, you know, I don't know, inhale some of these beliefs and ideas of progress and providence and just live on it for a while. Just, just get, a, you know, get a shot of it or something for a while. Bancroft believed that the practice of history contained philosophy and was second only to poetry as the diviner of heaven's intent. So for the English teachers out here, he put poetry first. And why not? It should be. Why should we even observe a George Bancroft and his vision of history today in the 21st century after world wars, the Holocaust, the atomic bomb, the Rwandan genocide, 9-11, and go on with that list? 
If our question is if or how America might ever again imagine a positive, unifying, hopeful narrative of our history, we do well, I think, though, to look back at one that claimed to have discovered it with such certitude in the middle of the 19th century in a society about to tear itself apart in civil war. I don't know if we're about to tear ourselves apart in civil war. There are all kinds of people speculating. Are we in a new civil war now? Is it a low-grade civil war? Uh, I, I try to avoid the term civil war to explain our current condition, although I kind of did do that in the Atlantic once. Sorry. Historians or professional academics and journalists who write history today by training tend to reject notions like destiny under providential direction. We're not comfortable with that. We're, not, we're trained not to be. Or are we? The broad public, even many serious readers of books, do not necessarily reject such notions. Most people love a story that tugs at the heart as much as at the head. Admit it. Make me feel the story. Yeah, make me learn. But damn it, make me feel it. Some neuroscientists and psychologists have shown that we may be indeed hardwired for such narratives, and our instinct may normally control our reason. If you go in very deep with the neuroscientists now, uh, you could get a little scared about just how much of our own thinking we actually control and how much of our hard wiring controls it for us. I try not to read too much of them. It gets depressing because we want to we, we control our minds. People want to see themselves in the narratives they read or consume in the popular culture or in their classrooms or on their nightstand. Most people want to find their good ancestors. Who does not want to discover a heroic great-grandparent? But what do you do when you discover a rather unholy great-grandparent? What do you do with them? Either way, Ancestry.com may take you there. And so might Hollywood. A Shangri-La or a Wakanga or an El Dorado are eternal human dreams of past that can make a better present, at least for a day or a season in a movie theater. Bancroft gave Americans who wished for it a white people's country with a glorious history and an even more special destiny. Bancroft's America was chosen for special work. A lot of us still want to believe that. In the popular imagination, historical narratives are always as much beliefs as they are histories. Collective memory tends to trump history. Sorry for the verb. Every person walking a street, managing a retail shop, plowing a field, sitting in a classroom, teaching in a classroom, or buying stock on a computer has a sense of the past in their mind. Everyone does. Virtually everyone has some narrative of who they are and where they came from. Many people do not want their favorite narratives disrupted by the critical tools of professional historians. But disrupt them, we must, and we do. And the good news, is that many Americans still read. Look how many of you are here. And hunger for history that challenges with new understandings. I have been so heartened on this so-called book tour to just meet so many people who read books and buy them. <laughs> The comfortable Bancroft from his perch at the New York Historical Society in 1854, speaking after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and in the midst of the roiling crises over slavery, its expansion, and its imminent threat to tear apart the American Union, could deliver such a sentimental certainty as this. 
God gives all the oppressed a hope of liberation, and our country stands, therefore, more than any other as the realization of the unity of the race. And by race, he implied the human species, mostly. But his only mention of an, what he called abolition of servitude in this work was in Prussia, in Hungary. The United States, said Bancroft, was, quote, bound to allure the world to freedom by the beauty of its example. Not one word appeared in the piece about the American crisis with servitude and slavery. That Bancroftian view, if you want, such a vision of a country always improving, alluring the world, heedless of self-reflection, regardless of reality and defiant truths, never dies. You can't kill it. Each time we think it has been put to rest somehow, it finds revival in groups wearing tricorner hats and waving don't tread on me banners or in xenophobia or in corporate style success-based patriotism or in an invasion of a Middle Eastern country whose history we did not know or in the election of a black president whose own patriotism jarred loose some of the worst racial instincts of large swaths of our country, or in mass rallies of people wearing red caps and demanding a return to Bancroft's Republic as they cheer their American Mussolini. The presence of race and slavery in the founding and development of the United States has forever been the unwelcome stepchild that threatens to tear asunder this idea of American unity. Indeed, it has torn us apart more than once. Pleasing, triumphal stories of America are almost, are almost always shipwrecked on the shoals of our tragedies and our contradictions and our recurring problem with white supremacy or what we seem to now call white nationalism. The notion of the United States as an essentially white Christian nation of citizens pledging allegiance to a flag and a history that was fundamentally not inclusive never dies. It has been energized recently by a political phenomenon. You all know this. Characterized by authoritarianism, racism, willful historical ignorance, worship of the God of American individualism, and a new version of an America first approach to our vast interconnected world. Almost as though it wants to erase the 70 years since 1945 when we saved the world. These ideas seem to persist and survive virtually any storm among their believers. Oligarchy, kleptocracy, and scandalous entertainment are, we may have to admit, just easier to establish in a media-saturated age than is real democracy. Actually, real democracy is the hardest thing to do of all. Whatever Trumpism may end up being in our history, and however it may be interpreted when it becomes a past rather than this disturbing present, it certainly has shown us that facts, stories, and history itself can be weaponized by politics. Of course, it has ever been thus. But we are living in a moment of acute recognition that however much the historical professions thought they had reshaped the nation's history and the curriculums in schools to the ends of inclusion, the forces of reaction are always waiting for us, and they're stronger than we sometimes imagine. For at least half a century, the field of African American history has challenged and enriched this American narrative. The most visible manifestation of this great change is now 
the new Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, which probably some of you have visited. If you haven't, you must. I'm actually going there literally this afternoon for a memorial service for a great historian, Ira Berlin. That bronze-colored four-story structure, here's a little hope for you. That big bronze structure right in the middle of the National Mall where one can gaze at the Washington Monument in one direction and back at the U.S. Capitol in the other and over at the White House as well shows in dazzling ways and on a remarkable scale how much African-American history is American history, how much the nation's story is intertwined with the black experience in all its forms at least visually, and certainly for thousands of visitors, and the lines still form there, to this hugely popular museum, a unifying narrative seems attainable. The National Mall, of course, tells a national story, and it should. But the most public story is no longer one only of the founders and the saviors of the nation. They should be there. The mall rightly emphasizes political and military leaders, as virtually all nations do. But the most national space now says the United States is and always has been a country not only of diversity, but also interconnected social, cultural, and political histories of special achievements and some of the worst catastrophes of our own making. And we have to see both of those. Slavery, racial segregation, the genocide against American Indians, the Japanese internment policy were all made by people and by American institutions. And so was the American victory over the Confederacy and against fascism in World War II, as well as the crusade to land those small little spaceships on the moon with their intrepid heroes flying inside. I still remember the first time I went to the Air and Space Museum and I saw those little capsules, that little can that John Glenn got in and I thought, I mean, I started weeping. I thought, oh my God, what heroes these, anybody that got into that thing and allowed them to blast them off into space, I don't even understand it. We are a people who wrote the United States Constitution and shaped it by compromises with slavery. We are our contradictions. Face them, teach them, learn them. We freed slaves and then lynched some of their children. We passed the 14th and 15th Amendments. And to this day, some of us still try to suppress the right to vote for some citizens because they support the opposing party. We invented technologies and machines that have forever changed life on our planet for the better and we invented the atomic bomb with its capacity to destroy all life. We learned how to clean our air and water, and we still willfully pollute that same environment. We have been beautiful and ugly as we have ventured abroad to seek commerce and to fight for our liberty and that of people we don't even know. We are famous for our hyper-individualism as well as the most generous nation in the world in times of crisis. We have almost as many kinds of patriotism as we have kinds of people. We have a Bill of Rights about which we profoundly disagree. No one ever sang Georgia on my mind quite like Ray Charles, unless it was James Brown. All of which is to say that we, as Americans, are an enormously complex, divided, polarized people, wondering how we survive as a whole. Among the many historians of the African American experience who directly confronted that old Bancroft view, that old Bancroft master narrative, was one of my mentors, uh, named Nathan Huggins. If you know any of Nathan's work, you, re you have read a great historian. In his little book called Black Odyssey, The African-American Ordeal in Slavery, 
first published in 1977, Huggins said he could not decide whether to be more astonished by the Founding Fathers' audacious, he called it, conception of a more perfect union, or by their, Huggins's word, purblind avoidance of the inescapable paradox, a free nation inspired by the rights of man having to rest on slavery. The founders, as well as generations to follow, wrote Huggins, refused to look into their own, what Nathan called, deforming mirror of truth. Theirs was a glorious beginning that needed an endless sanitizing to hold up to realities threatening the story at nearly every turn. Republics have always been unstable and violent forms of government. They need profound stories to hold them together. And Huggins had a beautiful way of teaching us, as he so often put it, that American history is not white history, it's not black history, it's not Indian history, it's everybody's history. Now, on the nature of unity and variety or diversity, on whether the whole human society can be successfully made from its parts, or whether a compelling story can be forged from a pluralism of experience and interest, greatly animated the thought of perhaps America's greatest philosopher and one of my heroes, William James. It, in one of his essays on pragmatism, entitled The One and the Many, if you're not a James reader and you need a place to start, I recommend that. It's a fairly short essay, but it'll stay with you. It'll make you reread it. The One and the Many. In that piece, James said that after long brooding, he had come to believe that the, quote, one and the many was the most central of all philosophical problems. How do you make a one out of many? The essential question of democracy. James contended that if you know whether a person is a monist or a pluralist, you know more about the rest of their thought than knowing any other thing. What did he mean? If only every self-possessed, individualistic, absolutist American could read William James, I think we'd be a better people. And we should have a test of citizenship. Read James. But can't do that. James distrusted absolutes. I believe this above all else. He distrusted that. He distrusted any totalizing explanation of history or of human behavior. He distrusted theories, really. The essence of pragmatism, in his view, was to leave the mind open, to test your truths. And what pragmatism means, another of his pragmatism essays, James said prophetically, quote, the greatest enemy of any one of our truths may be the rest of our truths. Truths have once and for all this desperate instinct of self-preservation and the desire to extinguish whatever, extinguish whatever contradicts it. My belief in the absolute based on the good it does me must run the gauntlet of all my other beliefs. Try to get up every day. It's very hard. And challenge yourself to test your truths. All right, most of us can't do that. All right, I'm not good at it either. I know what I love and I hate, and I don't want James to mess it up. But such a moving appeal for an open mind, for a self-willed, disciplined freedom of thought is very difficult to achieve. It asks us for a great deal of something way out of fashion right now, and that, of course, is humility. Go out and preach humility right now in Trump's America. No one will want to, no one will want to interview you. It can feel almost like a Sermon on the Mount, James is writing, for the pragmatic mind. 
This Jamesian premise aptly characterizes how we humans fashion, learn, and transmit the historical narratives we wish to think we live in. Don't mess with my historical story. I learned it from my grandparents, and I love my grandmother. Don't disrupt that for me. It helps us understand why we need such narratives, the good and the evil they might do. Master narratives of national histories, whether from Bancroft or somebody else, have exhibited desperate instincts of self-preservation. Sometimes the result is bloodshed of the worst kind when we fight about our stories, and sometimes intractable social conflict or alienation. To so many people, the social, political, and racial order can seem at stake in sustaining their story. Let me have my story. The order of my life depends on it. Now, James imagined a world in which it might be possible. He was writing in the late 19th century, turn of the 20th century. James imagined a world in which it might be possible to tell a whole story through and because of those contradictions. The natural universe compels us to consider, James's words, that the world is one. There are laws of physics and deep patterns in nature. Any scientist in our midst know that. Gravity and heat conduction are real. And they're permanent. Well, we hope. <laughs> Space and time, said James, are thus vehicles of continuity by which the world's parts hang together. But how one is the world, he asked, if people are the subject and not physics? To James, there were different kinds of unity. We too often celebrate the unities we find. Some things are conductors, he said, and some clearly non-conductors. <laughs> Those who insist that history must and ought to be driven by progress or by a particular religion or by any firm ideology may get disappointed. Those nations that have believed in their exceptional destiny, in inevitable revolution, who have reached for world domination built ever-expanding empires rooted in commercial or racial supremacy have virtually all failed. Think of the fascist experiment of the 20th century. Think of the communist experiment of the 20th century. Think of the British Empire. <laughs> Think of the Soviet Union. Think of versions of an American empire. Those nations that have believed in their exceptional destiny are fated for trouble. It doesn't mean they're not going to do it, and they will keep doing it. Some have destroyed whole civilizations in their spectacular failures. William James warned about this, quote, whoever claims absolute teleological unity dogmatizes at his risk. The world is actually one and not one, James argued, and he challenges us to deal with that. The great point, he wrote, is to notice, his words, to notice the oneness and the manyness, and wisdom lies in knowing which is which at an appropriate moment. When do we stress our individualism? When do we stress our group? And then when do we find our group as part of a whole? Isn't that what America's constantly trying to do? James knew that much is at stake in our stories, in what he called aesthetic union, meaning the stories we tell ourselves or the story that might hold us together. He acknowledged that, quote, things tell a story. Their parts hang together so as to work out a climax. 
Stories demand endings, and we can only unify them completely, he said, in our minds. In other words, we make stories. We give them their trajectories and their meanings, and we, f and we may fight to protect them when they are the essence of our identity. Stories that demand dogmas and absolutes will push us into false confidence. Better to assume that a sovereign, all-encompassing story ought to be imagined from its many parts as we can best know them, said James. To him, a people and a nation of multiple origins and ever more pluralistic parts needs to find its history with its eyes and its minds wide open. And he wrote this 120 some years ago. If the one and the many was to William James the greatest philosophical question, then it surely has been as well in America's struggle to hold together a unified historical narrative. Our grand motto, E Pluribus Unum, is beautiful in its aspiration. Making one from many has been our nation's quest. Well, sometimes. James did not make all this any easier. But hope lies, I think, in his premise. I quote him. Absolute unity brooks no degrees, he wrote. But pluralism has no need for the dogmatic temper. Absolutists are by temperament far more jealous of their ideas and their stories. In James's lovely words, pluralists allow, I quote him here, some tremor of independence, some free play of parts on one another. William James can make you believe that pluralism is not just this concept, not just some set of beliefs, but it's like a holy vision. And then he went on to say that the value of pluralism and the value of pragmatism is that it, quote, tends to unstiffen all of our theories. Unstiffen your theories unstiffen your absolutes. If we could all do it, we'd get along better. The trouble is, all of us can't do any one thing. Now, I want to end with just a few other thoughts, and then I want to hear from you. In the end, any national narrative, you know, a national story, whether it unifies us or not, is a story. Nothing drives the human imagination quite like our need for story. What's the first thing you do with a child? Well, after you feed them and nurture them, <laughs> you try to tell them stories. The famous guru of screenwriting, some of you may have his book, because you may have been either a professional or amateur screenwriter. There's a screenwriter in, like, Half the people I meet, I think, they all want to write a movie. But the great guru of screenwriting is Robert McKee. He wrote this book called Story. And he said, quote, story is not only our most prolific art form, but rivals all activities, work, play, eating, exercise for our waking hours. We tell and take in stories as much as we sleep and even when we dream. The key is saying, you are your stories. We're, we are our story. Such a bold claim he made that in 1997 could not have accounted for how social media, which hadn't come of age yet, may now have affected or maybe even corrupted our storytelling. I don't know. I don't know the end of that story any more than anybody else. But McKee had a good point. He offered a caution. <laughs> he said, quote, when storytelling goes bad, the result is decadence. 
And if Americans now flounder in an identity-obsessed search for or denial of a unified national story that gives us some kind of hope, the essential issues are nothing new. Tribal thinking is both ancient and current. Humans are creatures of the myths by which we define ourselves, the stories we choose to live within. In 1872, in The Birth of Tragedy, Friedrich Nietzsche noted that, quote, only a horizon ringed in myths can unify a culture. And in 1957, the great French writer Roland Barthes in his book called Mythologies, captured why myths, like the national narratives in which they are embedded, are both so necessary, he said, and so dangerous. Myths are the encoded stories from history that acquire with time a symbolic power in any culture. Myths, Barth observed, are the stories about which we have lost the memory that they were ever made up. They just exist. We just believe in them. They just are. Myths, said Barth, organize a world without contradiction, a world wallowing in the evident, a blissful clarity. Things appear to mean something by themselves. If we have a deep enough and a great enough myth to believe in, we can pretty much almost stop thinking. For many people, history can be nothing more than the myths they live by. Or it can be much more. Mythic narratives deeply informed by all their manifestations, parts, human achievements, disasters. In degrees, we can choose to warm our climate or arrest that warming. Something in our narratives and our myths is clearly at stake in that issue. Maybe the ultimate issue, all of us are on this planet, and perhaps only a species conscious unity, and not national unity, can solve the challenge of something like climate change if it's solvable. And it might yet profoundly alter how we think about the idea of progress. What's going to happen to that 19th century faith in progress in the 21st century age of climate change? I don't know. From the 1980s on, American historians at conferences and in all kinds of papers and presidential addresses and so on constantly were reckoning with narrative, with storytelling, with the fragmentation of our craft, of how we do history, how we've divided ourselves into so many categories and methods and fields and subfields, and often forgetting that nations actually still have histories. Even continents have histories. That there are holes out there still to be found from all these wonderful new gleaming parts that we have found. Anyone seeking to pluck a new, unified, hopeful American story out of our current social and political crises will be greatly frustrated. We need to take this on and we need to take it on with what I guess I would call an informed humility. But like the search for truth itself, the task is surely worth our energies and our imaginative effort. We must keep our balance, though, to use one of William James's favorite words. Our pluralism is a living, profound fact. It isn't going to go away. It's only growing. And as James well knew more than a century ago, our highest aim should be, his words, pluralism's doctrine, a world imperfectly unified. And Frederick Douglass seemed to grasp this idea as well about the beauty, complexity, and imperfection of human nature itself. A smile or a tear has no nationality, 
said Douglas in that speech, Composite Nation, in 1867. A smile or a tear has no nationality. Continuing with Douglas, joy and sorrow speak alike in all nations, and they above all the confusion of tongues proclaim the brotherhood of man. Like all dreams, a perfect union will always be unfinished and at times unreachable. But in this place and within this idea called America, we do need to have a choice and we do not have the choice not to try. Thank you. traveling from Springfield to where I live near Chester, and I saw a oh, very rundown place on yeah. the right, and a great big sign. Mm -hmm. And the sign said, Take Back America. Mm -hmm. What I remember was feeling a, uh, a chill going up and down my back. Yeah. And I really didn't know why. Mm -hmm. Current history says I know why. Uh huh. Okay. Just stop and knock on their door and ask them what they meant. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's <laughs> like uh, that could have come from left or right politically. You, you don't know. Yeah, it could have. Well, I doubt if it's on the left. But anyway, that's my own gut reaction. Okay. For those of us who haven't studied anthropology, yes. could you talk a little more about Benedict Anderson and where he falls, say, bet within mm -hmm. people that I do know, like Boaz and Mead? I've no, I've okay. never heard of him, so I don't know when he worked or any oh, of that. Okay, well, Benedict Anderson worked in the late 20th century into the early 21st century. He wrote about many things, especially South Asia, as I recall. But he is most famous for this analysis of nationalism, or what a nation is. Um, I only, I did that move academics do. They quote certain people because the passage fits. His notion of, and it's debatable, but his notion of a nation being an imagined community takes us right to the essence, well, that's what anthropologists do. It takes us to the, to the essence of story. It's, you know, what holds together a community that imagines it's a community? Well, they got some common story, something's in common, whether it's Vermonters or it's a church or it's a university or a school or a political group. You know, it's, it's there's some story with a set of principles, values, and so on that holds them together. Uh, it was in, it's interesting how a certain phrase like that can, can catch on. And it caught on particularly in the late 20th century when the world was so concerned with nationalism. And even in the wake of the end of the Cold War when people kept predicting that nationalism was now going to die. Do you remember that? Uh, what's his name said we were going to have an end of history? Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama. He's back now. You know, oh, is he back with that movie and whatnot. But no, that's, that's not... That, that's, not, that's not the right guy. Anyway, but history was going to end now. There wasn't going to be any global conflict and all that. Nationalism was going to dwindle away. But what happened in the wake of the Cold War? All kinds of new nationalisms just exploded out. And Benedict Anderson's idea then of na nations being these imagined communities that then reimagine when they have a chance, it was very useful. So that's a quick gloss on what that concept meant. Yes, ma'am. I appreciated your comment about the new museum of African American history on the, our National Mall. Yes. Uh, and I wonder if you would care to comment about the other new museum that's around there. I don't think it's on the Mall, the new museum of the Bible. I've never been to it. I don't know much about it. I know it exists. I don't, honest, ma'am, I'm sorry. I need to, to uh, well, I'm going to be in D.C. later today. I'll. I'm going to check it out over, I'll ask somebody over dinner. Um, 
What a great idea, though, uh, depending on how it's done. Who, who conceived it? Oh, it's an even, oh, okay. It's an even, okay, well, that's all right. I guess it's not on the mall, you say, so they didn't get congressional approval for it. It's close. Okay. Well, that's pluralism. How about a grand museum? Whoa, how'd you like to be on that organizing committee for the grand pluralistic World Museum of the Bible? Eight people on that commission. Let's have eight. It's your call. I want to be on that part of that that gets to decide about the Hebrew prophets, the Old Testament. And then I'll have to change my name probably, but what, a, what an idea. I, I do not know any more about that museum. I'm sorry. I wish I did. I'm going to find out now. Yes. Hi. You spoke about the demise of the great total narratives of the 20th century. Is it possible that the totalizing narrative we face now is transnational, the idea of global capitalism and resource extraction. Yeah. And can you talk about the contradiction between that narrative and you talk about the cultivation of species consciousness <laughs> that might be capable of addressing the yeah. enormous environmental challenges we face? Uh, the last part, I, I don't know where we will go with species consciousness. Uh, there are people who write about it. There are people, you know, and of course, World history is now a field, a teaching field, a writing field. The, the attempt to teach even the youngest of students an idea of human unity through pluralistic cultures across the globe, through time. Uh, I don't know that world history will lead us to species consciousness. It's possible the environment, if it gets bad enough, if climate change gets bad enough, if storms and fires and hurricanes and all the rest begin to obliterate coastlines, that. On the other hand, if history is a guide, it's probably going to lead to national and tribal conflict as well, uh, if history is a guide on that one. Um, the totalizing narratives of the 20th century, um, I remember my, the same Nathan Huggins that I mentioned very briefly here when he was in my life for two or three years. I spent two years at Harvard, and he was my senior colleague and hired me. He used to walk into the lounge of the department. He would sit down some days. This was in the late 80s. And he would say things like, God, I hate ideology. <laughs> Good morning, Nathan. You know. And by that, I think he meant uh, people you know, touting out their theory, touting out their absolutes. Nathan was a kind of an African-American pragmatist. Um, but think of the power, though, of the Marxist narrative, the power of the Marxist view of history. It, it, it will never go away, the idea of material aims being the primary motivation in our souls and our spirits. It's pretty hard to deny that in some ways. But whether it becomes a complete theory of history that's going to a particular place, another matter. The communist narrative, another matter. Um, you know, you could argue that in modern history, there have been essentially three grand narratives. The Marxist, the communist, and the Christian, or the Judeo-Christian. Theories of history that have purposes, destinies, places they're supposed to be going. If there is one today, you probably put your finger on it. It's globalization. It's a globalized economy, a globalized world, an English-speaking commercial world, an English-speaking transportation world. Is globalization our savior or is globalization our death? Is globalization at the root of all this resentment in the hinterland of America? Yes, probably. I mean, Ibram last night said, who I have great respect for, I love the guy, said, you know, that Trumpism can really be boiled down to its racism. I think that is often true, but there's also tremendous resentment out in rural America or, or you know, in the state I came from in Michigan. I have cousins who are farmers. Uh, they're about globalization, and they're, they're about the economy. They're about their resentments of cities. They're about their resentments of 
federal subsidies. They're about all kinds of economic resentments. And one's got to understand that if you want to understand Trump voters. And I got cousins who are Trump voters. And I tried to engage them in the weeks after the election, and it didn't work very well. Um, although they're beautiful people. They're wonderful. They're geniuses. These guys can take apart a combine and put it back together. It makes what I do look like nothing. But uh, globalization is a, a kind of totalizing story, if you like. But still, we have rigidly different cultures, rigidly different religions, and boundaries, 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 boundaries. Uh, and every time I feel, I don't always say this out loud, but every time I feel identity politics rising to the fore on my own campus, or I see it in my students, or I hear it in their voices, my group, my group, your group, my group, I, sometimes I want to just grab them and say, could we just stop and talk about Syrian children right now dying as refugees on boats? And could we just think about that for a moment instead of you all fighting about whose identity got enhanced last week and whose didn't, you know. But um, I don't know if, you know, if there is a totalizing theory of history now that people are willing to, to shimmy up to. I mean, think about it. Look what we experienced. If, if you have any sense of the 20th century, how many absolute theories of history are you going to be willing to believe in? I mean, look at, 20th century is the most violent history, the most violent century in human history. That's what I think my friend Nathan said when he sat down and said, God, I hate ideology. Look what it's done. Um, on the other hand, we all have ideology, don't we? I was so struck by the Frederick Douglass quote, the, the, optimis, the optimistic one, the first one you read. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a question. So do you think his optimism at that moment in the 1869, yeah. was about the shift in political power. I'm trying to relate it to our present moment right after yeah. the election. Was it because the radical Republicans had taken control and so he, that was the source of his optimism? Or was it something else? Did he believe that white resistance was going to somehow crumble and die of its own weight? A great way of putting that, and the answer is probably all of the above. To understand his own, I think, thoughts and feelings at that time, it is very much partly political. But as I tried to say last night in my little talk, one of the reasons he could sustain, one of the, what I use, eight reasons he sustained hope in his life was that he had a moral purpose. So this was, this was a moral phenomenon as well. In order to understand how Douglas might have felt in 1867 to 69, you almost need... Think of a moment in your own life that was triumphant about the world, about your country, your society. I don't know what that might be for you. I, I don't know, maybe the day after Obama was elected for some people. For others, it might be the, well, it might be the day Trump was elected. It might be, uh, I mean, my, my parents' memory of the end of World War II. Um, and then put it on steroids. Because Douglas is a case of, an, of, an, of a reformer, a radical reformer, born in 1818. 18, he's going to live till 1895. In the middle of his life, he's in his 40s, he sees his cause win in terrible bloodshed. But bloodshed, I have to admit, he welcomed. But how many of us live to see our great crusade, the purpose of our lives, if, if we're a public person, triumph in the middle of our lives and imagine a reinvention of your whole society? That's that moment for him. It was political, though, to go to your first point, because now this Republican Party, its leadership in that moment, it's not going to last very long. It's leadership like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner and Lyman Trumbull, who wrote the First Civil Rights Act, and John Bingham, who wrote Section 1 of the 14th. I think John Bingham needs to be on a coin or a bill or I need to wear John Bingham buttons now when we're having the anniversary of the ratification of the 14th Amendment because he wrote that passage under which we live. And if there's anything that holds this nation together, it's Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which is why the effort to get rid of birthright citizenship is so wrong. Yeah, sorry, I just thought I'd... 
express an opinion. But, do, but do, it was a political hope of that moment that the country had been wrested away from the slave power and was now in the hands of the abolition power, or so he thought. The trouble is, he's going to live long enough to see almost all of that triumph all but erased or betrayed before he dies in 1895. Let's we'll do one more, one more question. Uh, my question has to do with your talking about a unifying narrative. Mm -hmm. My question is, will climate change, which you just touched on at the end of your talk, yeah. become a unifying narrative uh, when uh, its inclusivity, which is global, and its dangers, which are infinitely on the horizon, uh, permeate uh, a, a, a majority of the people around the world, and we cannot deny the unity that we need to take on this change that we faced? I have no way of answering that, of course, any better than you do. The only thing I can offer is what a historian would offer. Look to the past, find those shocks in history. Now, this is a terrible thing to imagine, but when have humans in some collective way organize themselves to fight together. Uh, a huge part of the world to fight fascism in the Second World War. <sighs> um, you know, the international medicine, the triumphs of international science. Science is international, thank God. They invented a heart surgery in France that is now more widely used in America. I learned a lot about that because I had open heart surgery two years ago. Man, those heart surgeons, give them all the money they want, man. <laughs> um, but you gotta almost look, you know, maybe we're in new ground here, uh, new historical ground. We gotta look for those moments in the past where nations, peoples, cultures could actually come together. We had the Paris Accord on climate. It wasn't perfect, but we had it. But for the moment, we have a politics that wants to deny it and get rid of it and deny it and get rid of it. I don't know, but I, the only guide we have is where in the past has collective unity for a purpose come about across all these cultures and commercial networks I mean, we, for a while, remember all the optimism about the internet? The democracy of the internet was gonna save us. Facebook was gonna save us or, 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 or democratize us. And it did seem to for, I mean, social media was gonna democratize us and make us a whole, make us a world community. It has, <laughs> but it also makes other things possible like hacking our elections. Um, now Mark Zuckerberg is on the cover of the paper every day about whether he'll survive as though we're supposed to, I don't know, we're supposed to really care about the drama of Mark Zuckerberg's life now. Um, anyway, I don't know what else to say, but we got to look to the, and maybe that's a new kind of way of thinking even about curricula. If climate change in the next 10 years, and it's going to be faster than we probably think, begins to face us with questions, maybe we need new curriculum that says, all right, let's go in the past and study crises. Let's study shocks of events that did or did not unify cultures to work together. How do we find those? The international human rights story may be a model. The post-1945 development of international human rights regimes might be a model. And then perhaps you can think of others. Commerce itself could be at stake in climate change if trade itself becomes at stake, who knows? We might find allies where we're not sure we have them. Maybe the Koch brothers will change. <laughs> That's utopian. Gosh. And let me just say lastly, it is a thrill to speak to the Vermont Humanities Council and the audiences you bring together. Uh, I can't imagine the chance, the, the humbling chance to speak to such a group as you on a Saturday morning. And I'm sorry this is such a sobering topic. 
But I didn't choose the theme, I just spoke to the theme. So. <laughs> Thank you very much.